Okay, so welcome back everybody and welcome to the newcomers. So this is session five of a, a series I'm running called Mastering Meditation. You master meditation when you do it. That's as simple as that. <laughs> so all you need to do is do it. Practices are designed so that if you do them, they change your awareness of your experience in a very useful way. I'll explain how that works today because that's the key part of focus. So it's a little bit like juggling. So if you want to learn to juggle, what you need to do is set yourself some time to juggle and you do your few minutes a day juggling. And whether you like it or not, you get better at it. Because what you're doing is you're training your subconscious to catch the ball and to throw them in a particular way. And you train yourself by doing it. So you're either doing your juggling or you're not. If you do your juggling, you get better at it. If you don't, you don't. Uh, it doesn't seem to drift away that much. Once you've programmed it in, it stays there. Mindfulness does to an extent. Once it's programmed in, it stays there. But the, I, I noticed because I think about two or three years ago, I stopped meditating for three weeks over Christmas because I wanted to see what happened. And the thing that happened wasn't that the volume or the duration of thoughts was greater. What happened is my thoughts became grittier, more unhelpful, less comfortable. So that's the thing that regular meditation gives you once you've meditated for a while. And to get to that point takes a number of years, to be fair. But the way that I teach this now is in a frictionless way. So there's less need to be able to fit in your daily time. So a later session in this series is called Too Busy to Meditate. And in that, I explain the frictionless practices and the frictionless training method. Now, the traditional way that meditation has been taught it's not frictionless, and there's a lot of good reasons for that. And that, to be honest, that's the way I've been teaching it. But I've got wise to this. If you look at what meditation consists of, and what I teach is mindfulness meditation, which is what most meditation teachers teach. And the purpose of mindfulness meditation is to train yourself to bring your attention back to your present moment experience. And by that, what I mean is the sensory experience of now. What you can see, hear, smell, touch and taste. And the, whatever thoughts there are in your mind, provided you're aware of the thoughts as part of your present moment experience instead of being caught up in, in them. If you're caught up in your thoughts, we tend to drift away. It's called mind wandering. So that isn't mindfulness. Uh, a very well-researched well, a very well-designed piece of research by a couple of Harvard psychologists that has uncovered evidence that, on average, we spend, in the modern world, 47% of our day with our mind wandering. And so that, that's not mindfulness. Mindfulness is the... My, my definition of it is the undistracted awareness of the experience of the present moment. So if thought's part of the present moment and you're aware that your thoughts are arising, then you're present, which means you're, you're experiencing mindfulness. And, and it's the same with emotions. So it's not having a mind that's calm and clear and still like a mountain pool, which is what I wanted when I first started to meditate. And then the consequences of that are that you set yourself for all sorts of expectations and that those expectations actually get in the way of you achieving what you want, uh, which is unfortunate, but that's the way it is. And so what I do now is I, I teach in a way that helps new meditators to meditate in an expectation-free way. Obviously, the mind gets in the way of that, but... This, that's what this series is all about. And the next series, the next series is, is called Meditation and the Modern Mind, and I'll be starting it in March. 
if you want to train yourself to be present in the present moment, and you then want to train yourself to be less distracted by the past, the future, and your life situation, so that you can experience the present moment as it is, which for most people, for most of the time, is uh, a good experience. So the right, right now, in this very moment, in this room, there is no stress, for example. So if you're stressed, you've brought it in the door with you and you'll take it out again and it'll, you'll carry it around. And this is what happens in the modern world. A focus of mindfulness meditation is to bring us back to now and then the, the meditations work and there are various meditations that enable us to refocus our awareness on the sensory experience of now and the information that we're receiving from our ex present moment experience instead of the relentless drumbeat of the mind telling us whatever the drama of the day happens to be. There's a two-stage process there. One is focusing our attention on now and the other is focusing our attention within now. Very important distinction there. So the way the mindfulness meditations work, effectively they're mind-wandering exercises. And this is where seemingly everybody, meditation teachers and every student, will, will adopt this unhelpful concept that there's a tendency to want to silence the mind and there's a tendency to not want the experiences that arise in the present moment, especially if they're uncomfortable ones. It appears to be operating as a, a kind of act of avoidance and it, it's actually the opposite. It, there's this part of the common narrative, and you'll read it in articles if you read enough articles about meditation. Somebody who knows nothing about it will spout off about how that's just sticking your head in sand and avoiding how you feel. And, and actually it's completely the opposite because if you're noticing the sensory experience of now and there's uncomfortable emotions, then you're noticing the uncomfortable emotions and you're not, you're not distracting yourself from them, which is what we do most of the time. So the, the process of mindfulness meditation is firstly to train yourself to bring your attention back here and then to help you to refocus within the present moment so that you're not locked into the, the stress of your life situation, your future and, and the past. So that as, a, as that's a two-stage process there. Um, so what I'll do, I'll start off with a meditation that isn't a meditation for a lot of very good reasons. And a meditation that isn't a meditation, I call it the meditation of no meditation, as some of you already know. And that's, there's a very good reason for that. So the meditation that I teach, the teach everybody and, and I do, this is the meditation that we do in every session now, which isn't also isn't a meditation, which I call the meditation of no meditation, um, which is actually a listening exercise. And so the only instructions are to listen. Now you can either close your eyes or look down past the tip of your nose with your eyes half shut. That way you just don't get distracted by anything that's going on around you. And this is a, it's a waiting exercise really. It's more like waiting than doing anything else. And what are we waiting for? We're waiting for the next sound. Whatever that might happen to be. So conveniently, in the park and in the mansion, there's a, a lovely variety of sound. Let me get the 
birds and you get the doggies out in the path and you get people chatting in the mansion and walking around and there's movements in the room, traffic in the distance sometimes and sirens and then there's airplanes. So if we're quiet, we can notice those sounds, but in a special way, in a way where we're waiting for the next sound, always. And notice that the next sound can come from anywhere. It can be all around you. So what we're doing there is we're scanning our environment for sound. And we can notice that one sound is followed by another sound. another sound, and another sound. And all we're doing is listening. So there's no instruction. So you know, we're not trying to calm the mind. We're not trying to relax. We're not trying to not think. We're not focusing on anything except for that next sound, whatever it might happen to be. So there's no trying. This is just waiting. Just waiting, waiting for the next sound. And so in your very own time, to turn your attention to the room. So that experience has got a couple of things in it. Immediately obvious. One is that for 95% of people it's quite a frictionless experience, although there is that 5%. Anybody find it difficult to do that? It's okay if you do, if you do. And that's busy mind. Yeah, it just, yeah. Um, so, unfortunately, I taught you the traditional way before I taught you this way. And so what you've 
done probably is you're looking for a calm mind in your meditations. Yeah, and so you find you're, you've adopted this as a meditation. Um, the most useful way of approaching that is to remind yourself that it isn't. <laughs> so it's not a meditation. And there's no goal. There's no expectation. You don't want anything from it. So this isn't one of these mindfulness meditations that trains you to bring your attention back to now. What it is, is two things. It's, a, it's an introduction to meditation, because uh, it's largely frictionless, and, it, and it's also a present moment experience. So there's a bit of mindfulness and a bit of meditation in it. It kind of overlaps in a lot of ways. And not only is it frictionless, it's also incredibly flexible because you can do it pretty much anywhere and at any time. So if you do that now, listen for the next sound. You can notice that you can do it while you're listening to me speak. So this is something you can do in your day whenever you bring, it's brought to mind to do it. And one of the other things is that if there's an irritating noise, the modern mind tends to get obsessively hooked onto the irritating noise. And there could be other noises, but we're, we're stuck on it, like a record stuck in a groove. And it helps to step out of that and do the meditation of no meditation and notice whatever other noises there are. It takes down the unsatisfactoriness of the experience of, diminishes it as, a, as an emotional experience, become more, becomes more comfortable. Okay, so that's the introductory practice. And you can do that largely wherever you are and whatever you're doing and whenever you want. Not only is it frictionless as a practice, it's also frictionless in that you don't need to allocate any time. These are the main reasons people come to meditation, is they've got a very busy mind, or that they've got a very busy life, or both. And often they go together, so having a busy life tends to create a busy mind. And what happens is that you come along to learn meditation, and when you're taught in the traditional way, you're taught meditations that actually bring to your attention even more than normally how busy your mind is, so they become unsatisfactory. And as well as that, if you've got a busy life and you get another thing to do. You've already got all these other things to do. You've got to work, you've got chores at home, you've got an endless supply of tasks and priorities and things to do. And then you've got to do all these things for your wellness. You've got to do your yoga. You've got to do your run. You've got to eat your five a day. It's endless, right? So us giving you another thing to do is not a helpful thing. But if it's something that you can do during your day, so you're walking along the road and you're listening, waiting for the next sound, then you don't use up any time. So it's not only a frictionless experience, it's also a frictionless training method. Okay, so what I'm going to do is do another meditation of no meditation. This is the meditation of no meditation for the breath, and it isn't actually about the breath. It's about movement, and the movement is the movement of the belly just at the point where the belly meets the chest. And you're noticing the belly rising and falling. Noticing the belly rising, noticing the belly falling.
So if you're a busy-minded meditator, and this is in any way unsatisfactory, only if you're a busy-minded meditator. If you find it frictionless, you just carry on doing it. Noticing the belly rising. Noticing the belly falling. For the busy-minded meditators, what you do is add a mantra to it. And the mantra, what you're doing is labelling or noting the movement of the belly. And you're noting it by using your inner voice to note it by saying in your mind, rising, falling, rising, falling. But for every other, everybody other than the busy-minded meditators, which is the 90, probably 90% of people, 85, 90% of people. All you do is you notice the movement. No goals, no expectations here. There's, we're not trying to do anything. So there's no way of doing it wrong. Another way of framing this is that you're waiting for the next breath. So while the belly's rising, you're waiting for the belly to fall. While the belly's falling, you're waiting for it to rise. You focus on it however's comfortable for you, whatever's the most comfortable. So you could just be noticing the movement, or you can be saying in your mind, rising and falling as you breathe in and out. Or you can be waiting for the next breath. Whatever's the most comfortable. So again, whenever you're ready in your very own time, gently return your attention to your surroundings. I'll show you with sound what you're focusing on. So if you listen to the bell, The sound of the bell goes on for something like 15 seconds. But when you listen to it, you're not listening to that 15 seconds. You're listening to a tiny little sliver 
of that 15 seconds. That's, it's as if it's moving through the sound of the bell, or the sound of the bell is moving through time. Notice the movement through time, or the movement of time. And notice what's in that tiny little sliver of sound. Just the sound. Nothing else. No bank balance, career choices, relationship difficulties, property values, car maintenance, difficult neighbours, stroppy colleagues, irritating boss, nothing. That's what we're looking for, is that experience. At some point, meditation becomes a refuge because you're able to find this, but that's only a temporary thing. That's why they get the idea that it's, it's a way of zombieing out and burying your head in the sand because when you find that present moment and there's none of the life situation or the past or the future in it it becomes rather precious and you keep repeating it so it's one of the things that hooks people into meditation once they get there they get that moment they think i like that and the, even the emotional brain likes it even the modern mind likes it because it's a relaxation from the relentless drumbeat of the experience of living in a crazy, crazy society and a busy world. That's it. It's like a, a tiny vacation, a micro vacation. Once you've found that, and hopefully these practices help to introduce you to it, your emotional brain goes, yeah, I like that. I'll, I'll have some more of that, please. And then you've got a positive motivation to do the practices. But you notice those two, the meditations of no meditation, they can be done wherever you are, whatever you're doing. So you can be watching the TV, you're noticing the belly moving, you're listening to somebody talk, you, you're noticing your belly move. And it's not, it doesn't take your entire focused awareness, so you're able to multitask, <laughs> multitasking meditation. What we're going to do now is I'll introduce you to the experience of refocusing on the present moment. Everybody has a mind that produces spontaneous thought. So you don't know what the next thing you're going to think is. Nobody does. Don't know what the next thing is. It, it shocked me when I discovered that I was about 56. So how can you live for all of these decades in your life without actually recognizing that I don't know what the next thing I'm going to think is? And that we've got 8 billion people don't know that. And it's a simple fact. People aren't aware of it. And so we get unhelpful beliefs such as, I am my thoughts. Yeah. When you're listening to this, one of the things that tends to happen is the mind becomes silent. And to meditate when you're sitting, your first priority is to be comfortable, especially if you've got a bad back or something like that. You know, you need to sit, especially on these not most comfortable chairs in the world. You need to sit in a way that's reasonably comfortable. And then once you're comfortable, the other important things are 
feet flat on the floor, elbows by the side. You can either lean against the chair back or sit up. If you sit up, that's fine. If you lean back, that's fine. I lean back. No reason not to. With the elbows by the side, that improves our posture, balances our posture out. And you're looking for the point at which the skull is most comfortably balanced on top of the spine. The point of maximum comfort. Find that, and that's where you leave your head balanced on top of your spine. And ideally, we're noticing the breath in the nostrils. But if you prefer, if you find that in any way uncomfortable, go back to noticing the movement of the belly. What we're doing is noticing the breath rising and falling, either in the nostrils or in the belly or wherever else. Chest rising and falling, shoulders, air hitting the back of the throat, whatever's comfortable. And now we're noticing the breath, what we do is count the breath. Count one on the in-breath, two on the out-breath, three on the in-breath, four on the out-breath, up to ten. When you get to 10, start at one again. When you lose count, begin at one. So that's one on the in-breath, two on the out-breath, three on the in-breath, four on the out-breath, up to 10. Get to 10, begin at one, lose count, begin at one. You just repeat that for the next few minutes. I'll begin and end the meditation with a bell in the traditional way. This is called counting the breaths.
breathing in, noticing whatever it is you can smell and taste and the sensation of sitting and in your very own time. Gently return your attention to your surroundings. And so what happens when we count the breaths is that we lose count because the mind wanders. And because we're counting, we notice that the mind's wandered quite quickly. So the, the meditation we're going to do in, in a little while, following the breath, it's possible for the mind to wander for a long time. But it's less possible when we're counting the breath. So you notice the mind's wandered and you come back and start counting at one again. And you're counting away. You either lose count, don't know where you are, and you go back and start at one. Or you're counting and you notice you're counting 23, 24. <laughs> and you go back to one again. What's happening there is, is three things. We're noticing the breath, the mind wanders, we notice that the mind's wandered, and that's the bit we're practicing. So that's like catching the ball in juggling. You're in juggling, basically, you're practicing catching the ball over and over again. And the way you practice it is by doing it, and at first, when you start, it's more like a picking the ball up off the floor session than it is a catching the ball session. And the way you train yourself to catch the ball is by doing it more and more. And what we're doing is training ourselves to notice that our minds wandered. And the way we do that is by doing it more and more and more. But the modern mind and many meditation teachers and meditation students look at it as a competition to try to stay counting. So getting to 10 is good, not getting to 10 or getting to 53 is bad. This is a false dichotomy. We're creating a good and bad experience. It's not like that. Yeah. What we actually want is for the mind to wander so that we notice because we're training ourselves to notice that our minds wandered. So in a way, the more the mind wanders, the more we notice, and each time we notice the mind's wandered, that's like catching a ball. And if juggling is catching, training yourself to catch a ball, the more you catch a ball, the better. So in a lot of ways, the more times you lose count, the better. And you know, I, I, know, I know people who've been meditating for 40 years and they say they only get a 10, 80% of the time because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's not a competition. But the modern mind will make it a competition. And when it does, remind yourself in the same way that you notice that your mind's wandered, notice that you're setting up a competition and let go of the competition and Repeat the practice, mind wanders, notice, back to the next count, back to the breath, back to one, repeat over and over again. So the mindfulness meditation is a mind wandering experience. That's why we have neutral experiences like the breath, nothing more neutral than the breath. Unless you've got a respiratory issue, you can't distinguish between good and bad breaths. Last breath, a good breath or a bad breath? Ask yourself that question. No such thing. So it's very, very neutral. So we've set ourselves up with a neutral experience. What happens in neutral experiences? The mind wanders. So this is, what, this is why I teach following the breath instead of mantras. That's where you're repeating words in your head. You can do that. So this is one of the options for those people if, if anybody finds noticing the breath uncomfortable. Mind wanders, back to the breath, 
if it's uncomfortable, doing a mantra is a, a good alternative. The other thing you can do is um, a mandala. Got this wonderful Grecian style ceiling here. Well, I don't know if it's Grecian. Yeah, with a little Wedgwood platters on it. To say that there's at least a hint of Grecian here. And they've got like, unicorns, oh, they're, they're flying horses. And there's all the colors. So what you could do is you could focus your attention on a piece of detail. Let the mind choose the detail. Don't be rigorous. You, you know, so it could be anything. It can be any of the details on the doors and the windows, the way the light shines off of something. You just allow yourself to notice that, that visual element. And your mind will wander and you bring your attention back to the visual element mind wanders. So it's exactly the same thing. Because remember what we're training is not what we're focusing on. We're training ourselves to notice that the mind wandered by allowing it to wander over and over again and noticing it over and over again. We've done three of these meditations now with different sorts of focus. One is I've introduced you to the tiny little sliver of time that is the present moment. Here it is again. I've introduced you to the experience of waiting for the next sound to appear in the present moment, wherever it might happen to be. The experience of noticing the movement in the belly. Very much a present moment experience. And we've done the counting the breaths meditation where you're noticing your mind wandering over and over again. Which brings me to the key mindfulness meditation. If you do this for, say, 20 minutes a day, 15, 20, 25 minutes a day, say. If you did, if I, if I could sprinkle magic meditation dust on everybody and you all went away and you know, rearrange your life so that when you wake up in the morning, you're doing your, bit. start off with 15 maybe, then go up to 20, 25. You do your 25 minutes of meditation every day. Five years' time, your life will have changed completely. 10 years' time, completely again. It's designed to do all of, and all of the experience of your life will come into that 15, 20, 25 minutes. And it will all be greeted the same way as part of the experience of now. So this next meditation, this is the following the breath meditation. And it's got four lines in the script. Notice the breath. Ideally in the nostrils, but can be anywhere else that you notice the breath. Mind wanders, return to the breath, repeat. So, notice the breath, mind wanders, return to the breath, repeat. It's all following the breath. Let's practice this for the next few minutes.
again, breathing in and noticing what you can smell and taste and the sensation of sitting. And in your very, very own time, gently, patiently, compassionately, you turn your attention to your surrounding. Okay, so that, that's the ideal meditation to do, but what notice what's changed throughout those meditations. We've gone from a meditation that's almost universally frictionless to a meditation that many people find challenging because the busy mind gets in the way and they find themselves mind wandering a lot and they set up their own internal competition to stay focused on the breath and they think it's about focusing on the breath. They don't realize that it's about mind wandering and noticing your mind's wandering. It's moved up in terms of friction. What you need to do is find the one that's frictionless, practice that. Some people, so there's something like 15% of people find the last meditation frictionless, and they like to do that, in which case do that. And counting the breaths, 45% of people find that frictionless. They like to do that, so do that. And then there's noticing the movement of the belly. 85% of people find that frictionless. So if you want, you can do that. And 95% of people find waiting for the next sound frictionless. You can do that. And it changes from one day to the other. So you might sit down, oh, low the friction, mind busy, hating it. You move down the friction scale. And do move down the scale in terms of time as well. Don't say, right, I've got to do my 15 minutes, so I don't know my 15 minutes. Here's a meditation. You've, you've done it a few times today. This is a 15 second meditation. Here we go. So that's meditation and focus.